Thank you for joining us on That's a Good Question, a podcast where we answer your questions from last Sunday's sermon at Peace Church. We hope that these answers will encourage you and help you see the depth and beauty of the gospel. Let's dive into this week's questions. Hey everybody, welcome to That's a Good Question. I'm John, I'm here with Cheyenne, who is our leader of our women's ministry here at Peace Church. And we are excited to talk about some questions that have to do with the Christian faith or with a sermon that was preached this past Sunday at Peace Church. We're walking through the book of Job and we are in uh, sermon number four out of five coming up on the end. This week we talked about Elihu and we've got some great questions to talk about. So should we All right, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Okay. First question. What do we say to someone when they ask, why me? Which is a popular question for somebody who's suffering. Why me? Why did this happen to me? That's such a such a hard hard question to answer, and I I do think that the last couple sermons, so this sermon and the last one, um, in both of them we learned that it's okay to not even have a, an answer sometimes, you know, to just to sit in in silence and to be understanding of why they're asking that question. That yeah. you don't ask that question if you haven't experienced some pretty severe harsh suffering. So I thought that PB and Pastor Nate answered that really well. Some ideas for how to handle that um, last last time, but then this time too, just talking about the humility of Elihu to to wait until it was his turn to talk and then and then to talk. So I yeah. think that's yeah I've yeah as a pastor yeah. sometimes when you go into a situation people will ask that question and they'll direct it at me as the pastor. And I often just say, yeah, I'm so sorry. I understand why you would ask that question. Yeah. We don't know why. Yeah. Um, we don't know why is often the answer I give. Um, I think it's the truest and most honest answer. I don't, mm-hmm. you know, there are some general things we could say about God's sovereignty and why he allows suffering in the world. Um, but specifically, we don't know why God has ordained suffering in this person's life or why that's happening. Sure. So I think it's a good, it's honest, and hopefully doesn't try to presuppose too much on their situation. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that we can do is encourage them to take their question to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the whole book of Lamentations mm-hmm. where, you know, uh, Solomon is lamenting to the Lord. And he accuses he accuses um, the Lord of some pretty harsh things, too. And yet he brings it back around and says, you know, yet therefore I will remember um, that you are my hope. And one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 42. Mm -hmm. And that Psalm starts like really, it sounds really great. It's like very poetic and beautiful as the deer pants for the water. Mm -hmm. So my soul longs for you. Um, But what he's actually talking about is feeling like God's presence is nowhere near him. And Mm -hmm. he even goes on to essentially accuse the Lord of of trying to drown him. Mm. Um, and yet he says, um, but I will remember that you are, you are my hope and my salvation. And so even though his soul is, is crying out in despair, um, he'll remember that God, God is there. Yeah. Um, yeah. A similar one is Psalm 77. It's one of my favorites. Um, it starts out with the psalmist voicing all those complaints to God. Uh, and one of the questions he asks is, has the Lord forgotten to be ca- compassionate? Um, has the Lord forgotten to be forgotten to give me his compassion, his love, his mercy. Um, and then he answers, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. And he goes through, he recounts the history of God's people and all the, the things in the Bible of how God's been good and faithful to his people and reminds himself uh, that God has not forgotten to be gracious. God is God does still love me. Um, and he tries to remind himself of those good things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're not trying to like invalidate them by saying, but remember, God mm-hmm. is great. and He's so yeah. good. Just letting them express it, like giving them the freedom to express it. Yeah. Um, and that is what Job is doing too, right? I think um, one of the verses in Job that, you know, we had, we went really big picture last week with the sermon and went, I don't even know how many chapters. 29. 29. 29 okay. Chapters. But one of the things that um, we skipped over, unless you were like reading along with it, is in Job 19, Job, um, he says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. And they were. Like God has given us this pattern for laments, for expressing why me, and yet also coming around to what has God done for us. 
Um, and he goes on to that because Job, Job is like early in 19, he is accusing God of things. Um, but he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. Mm. And I just love that. Like, I wish Job, I don't know. I just wonder, like, I wonder if Job knew that his words were going to be inscribed forever yeah. for us. Um, this beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, definitely. So, yes, we want to give people space to to express that feeling. The Bible gives space for that. Um, but let's say somebody presses further and says, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. No, really. Why would God let this happen to me? What if they press further and they really want an answer mm -hmm. to that question? Mm-hmm. Well, we live in a fallen world, and I think it all goes back to Genesis 1 through 3, right? Um, and so in a fallen world, until Jesus returns to restore all things, we are going to face suffering. Mm -hmm. And Jesus promises that even, you know, um, we, can, we can expect some suffering in this world. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that that is what we should... Um, sit in as something that um, we should be like, oh, well, of course you're going to have suffering. You know, we want to be understanding that that's yeah. not how it's meant to stay. But um, yeah. Yeah. I think of uh, like kind of the middle portion of Romans chapter eight talks about the creation groaning mm -hmm. um, and being in misery until the end, until uh, the sons of God are revealed, as it says which is until Christ will return and make all things new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we live in a world that's broken. Um, you know, thinking of the story of Scripture, the base and most foundational reason that we suffer, uh, the why, is because of sin. Sin mm -hmm. entered the world when Adam and Eve sinned. Um, and so our world is mm -hmm. broken. It's messed up. It's not the way God made it. Um, so ultimately, actually, the blame does lie on human mm -hmm. beings, humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, each of us are not necessarily suffering for our own individual specific sure. sins. We're not trying to blame the the victim here and say that um, because you did this, you've gotten sick. That's uh, that sort of thinking. That logic is ruled out several times in the Bible. Jesus rules that out in several passages. Well, and here Job, in Job, yeah, right? Uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. So, but it does but, give us yeah. like uh, that eagerness for yeah. things to be restored. Yeah. Right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the hope that we wait for. Um, I I do sometimes think that uh, myself and some of the some of the health issues that I've had and stuff. I do think um, you know we always pray for healing now. Um, try to enjoy the good times. Try to survive the bad times. But one of the thoughts that I do regularly have is just that I think of some of the things that I can't do now or that maybe I won't be able to do during my life that I would have wanted to do, and I think, but someday I will. Um, there is another life. It's not just this life. You know, sometimes we try to um, get ourselves all amped up and excited by saying you only got one, you know, YOLO, you only got one life to live. And so, you know, do it all, have it all. But actually, I've been comforted by the idea that the opposite is actually true. You don't just have one life to live. You have an eternal life to live. Mm -hmm. And so this life can be all about God's glory. Mm -hmm. It can be all about doing what God's called us to with what we have. And knowing that enjoying other things will be on the other side. We'll have all of eternity to enjoy um, God's design, to get to be with God first and foremost. But uh, I sort of imagine even, you know, in the remade heavens and earth, uh, you know, maybe I'll get to travel to places I didn't get to see. Maybe I'll get to, um, you know, do, you know, physical feats that I didn't get to do here, run a long ways and do all kinds of things like that. So those are comforting. I love that. Yeah. Cool. So great question. Um, let's roll on to the next question. Here we go. Should we stay away from reading the Apocrypha or are there some things to learn from it? If we should stay away, why? So good question. So they're talking about the Catholic Apoc Apocrypha. So the Catholic Bible has more books than the Protestant Bible. If you didn't know that, they've got some bonus books in there. And uh, in short, the reason that they have more books than, than us is that those books we would say are not part of the canon. They're not part of uh, the Bible. They're not books that are inerrant, uh, authoritative, ones that we can, you know, guarantee who they were written by or that they were written by an apostle who was authorized by the Lord to do so, inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so. Um, in short, they're not authoritative, inerrant books. They may be helpful, but they're not the Bible. So how would you decide what kind of limits to 
to give them? Is it worth yeah. reading them at all even? Yeah. So guys like Martin Luther and John Calvin, guys, the reformers, 1500s, um, guys who were wrestling with this question, they're moving from being in the Catholic Church to uh, leading the Reformation and, and beginning the Protestant Church. They answered the question by saying that they they can be helpful. Go ahead and read them. There's some interesting stuff in there. You might benefit as a Christian from stuff in there, but they're simply not the Bible. Um, and actually, I'm not any kind of huge expert in the Apocrypha, but in, in the little that I do know, there are some passages in there that I think would lead you in the wrong direction. There are some passages that would lead you towards thinking that there are certain works you can do in order to earn God's favor uh, or salvation, um, giving of alms and different things like that that it talks about. There's a couple of historical inaccuracies, which we know wouldn't happen in God's inspired inerrant word. Uh, so I would land on, yeah, they can be helpful. Go ahead and read them. You don't have to be afraid of them, but just know they're not the Bible. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, first and second Corinthians. I've heard that there was another letter to yeah. the Corinthians written by Paul, who is mm -hmm. considered an apostle. How do we know if we were to find that? Uh, how, how would we know if that should have been considered in the canon if, yeah. if we were to find that now in 2023? Good question. Great question. Um, first of all, uh, what I say is so, you know, one of the one of the uh, requirements for a book of the Bible is that it's uh, written by an apostle. Right. Uh, so. It is written by the Apostle Paul. Okay, we know that that letter does exist somewhere, but I think the fact that it was lost to history tells us that it wasn't a letter that was universal. So one of the other requirements is that it's a letter that's considered universally valuable to the church. So I think the fact that it's not included in the Bible, wasn't uh, contained in the canon, is, tells us that the early church didn't think that this was a letter that should be considered universally applicable and 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 helpful for the whole church. So that'd be my short answer is that no, I think if we found it now, probably not included in the Bible. I would a agree. Great question. I would agree. I know. Great I just question. think it's an interesting thing no, to that's a great, yeah. talk about like, oh, how do we, how would we answer yeah. that if someone were yeah. to ask us? But I think the other thing too is that we can't think that now in 2023, we've gone 2000 years without it. Like yeah. that would be, it's not something that has been enduring. And I think yeah. that's another part of the canon is something that has endured. Yeah. Um, and to find it um, written in history, it still it still means that we went two thousand years without it. Sure, and that um, doesn't fit right. the canon either. So. Yeah, that's good. All right, next question. So this past Sunday was Mother's Day, so Mother's Day related question. Uh, the writer of the question asks. They point out that there are some passages that talk about God having some mother like qualities. And they asked the question this, does this mean that it's okay to pray to God using she slash her pronouns? Is this passage and others like it, and they list some passages, proof that God affirms transgenderism? So some of the passages that they list are Isaiah 49, 15, Psalm 131, 2. Um, and we thought of some other ones, uh, passages that refer to God uh, like a nursing mother or like a hen gathering her chicks. So great question. Very interesting. Uh there are some passages in the Bible that refer to God having some uh, feminine, mother-like qualities. What do you think, Cheyenne? Does that mean that we should pray to God as a she? No. I think that we should stick with the way that Scripture talks about God mm. and use um, male pronouns for him. I do not think it has any affirmation on transgenderism. Um, however, I do think that this is a great question, and I think it's something worth noting that um, in Genesis, it says that God created them, male and female, um, in his own image. So his own image means that there are ways that you as a man um, represent God in a way that I do not. And as a woman, mm -hmm. um, there are ways that I bear the image of God that yeah. a man cannot. And yeah. I think that um, that is what this is showing. It's just pointing to what we see already in Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And I would add, you know, the, so scripture uses some figurative language like that. You know, sure. those are sort of like analogies. Yeah. Um, scripture also calls God a rock or a fortress, right. but we don't refer to God as an it, you know? Yeah, that's so, a good point. Yep. Um, these are analogies for characteristics of God. And like you pointed out, God has, yeah. yes, God made man and woman in his image. And so we both reflect um, God and who he is and yeah. parts of him, yeah. different aspects of him. Um, but that doesn't really mean we can use different pronouns. Like you said, yeah, right. uh, God is always referred to as our father. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus, of course, came to the earth as a man. Um, so God did reveal himself 
in a gendered sort of way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he covered it. God gave us uh, the two the two genders, and God revealed Himself specifically as yeah. one of those. Yeah. So it's good. But I do want to say on the other side, thinking of Mother's Day. Mother's Day was a great chance for us to get to think and reflect on um, all the amazing ways that our mothers do show God's character and who he is and his love for us. Um, and so great chance to get to kind of reflect on that part of God and who he is. Yeah. 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 I love yeah. that. Good. All right. One last question for us. How can Christians begin to examine our own worldview and presuppositions? All right, so this one's related to a point that Pastor Ryan made in the sermon about presuppositions and our worldview. So how can we begin to examine our own presuppositions and worldview? Uh, Pastor Ryan encouraged us to be humble with those. How can we do that? Well, I think sometimes it can start with just trying to discern what things are presuppositions and what things are are, are doctrines. So what things are coming from the word that are theology-based and what things are more of our interpretation of that theology or our application of that theology um, or lack of application, maybe, too. Um, so I would say, you know, reading scripture and not just reading it like um, like it's a you know magic eight ball of like, well, let's see what does he have for me yeah. today and reading one, you know, one little we passage. laugh about that, but I, I've I've had friends that, oh, sure. that they thought that was the way to read the Bible. Yes. So just sort of drop yeah. it, let it fall open. And that was God's word to you for the day. Yeah. yeah. So I think reading, you know, reading it extensively, um, even the parts that are hard. And I think that that at peace, we're trying to do a good job of helping people through reading some of the hard parts like Job can yeah. be also. If you were to take <laughs> you just think about if you were to take part of what Job's friend said and just like just zoom in on that and assume that that's something that God said, well, it's taking it out of context. Yeah. So you really need the whole book of, yeah. of Job. Um, that would be one one suggestion that I would have for a starting point for how to examine yeah, what's totally. presuppositions and what's accurate theology. Yeah, yeah. In uh, in Bible college, they had a popular saying that always said, uh, "A text without a context is a pretext for disaster." Oh, or they'd that's put something good. A text without a context is a, a pretext text. for disaster. Um, and that's just it. So we need context. We need to think. All right, you got to put yourself in the place of. Job and that time period. So that's why we do a little bit of study on the historical context. When did this happen? Uh, where did they live? You know, west side of the globe, east yeah, side of the globe. Right. Get some of those kind of ideas in your mind and think, okay, you know, um, when they're talking about this, well, he didn't have a McDonald's down the road. That's, uh, you sure. know, you, you, even the passage of time is a very simple mm -hmm. one. Those are presuppositions. Mm -hmm. They just, they didn't live in the same time period as us. They didn't have some of the same technology as we did. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't educated in the same way that we are. They didn't speak the same language that we speak. So even just, just, I think one of the basic things you can do is just think about the context of the original audience who's reading this text of the Bible and think, how am I different from them? And mm -hmm. if you can list out a handful of ways that you're different from them, you're already starting to, to discover some of your presuppos presuppositions that you bring to the text. Yeah. I think maybe another way that we develop presuppositions is from a um, Christian culture that's not necessarily um, you know, maybe it's more of like a, this Facebook group or this, these influencers or something like that, where we are, um, developing presuppositions that we assume like everyone in mm. our church has, but are really maybe not, not exactly. And so I think, um, I feel like we've talked about this before, even on here, and that's a good question, but like figuring out, finding out like, what is the fruit of the people who are, um, Christian influencers that you're following and that you are developing some of your presuppositions from. Mm. Um, and then examining your own heart. Like, is this something that is building fruit in my life? Mm. Um, or is it something that is is doing the opposite yeah. of that? Yeah. Yeah, good point. So that's, I mean, that's a whole category of presuppositions. Uh, yeah, sure. the, the the people you listen to, right? The the podcasts, the books, the messages, Um it's, always, it's one of the questions that I really like to ask people when, when I'm in casual conversation with them is, hey, who do you listen to? What kind of books do you read? That yeah. kind of stuff. And it's always very interesting to me what people listen to because you can usually kind of, there's there's groups, right? If you yeah. listen to this, you probably also listen to this person. Um, if you listen to this, you maybe you almost definitely don't listen to this over here. And so that's, that's its own set of presuppositions. And so being really careful about who it is that you're listening to, reading, um, making sure that you're sticking with people who are faithful to 
God's word. Yeah. And which brings us back, you know, full circle to how do you know if they're being faithful to God's word is by being in it. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Awesome. Great questions there, buddy. Thank you, Cheyenne. Yeah. Appreciate it. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to That's a Good Question. If you want to discover more resources from Peace Church, head to our website at peacechurch.cc. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a review. It helps us get more gospel-centered, family-focused, and kingdom-minded resources to more people. You can find That's a Good Question at resoundmedia.cc or wherever you listen to podcasts.